podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first-time Stephen King reader. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast that floats down here. Tonight we are discussing It, Chapter 2, it released this year on September 6th, 2019. Actually, last year, September 6th, 2019. It was directed by Andy Machete, screenplay by Gary Dauberman. Uh, total box office draw for it was $472 million worldwide. It didn't top the first one, but it still is in the records of, I believe, top five or six of all time horror film uh, movies for a uh, dollar amount. So I, I thought that was pretty good. So let me get your guys's hello, Luke and Melissa joining me as well. Uh, let me get your guys's initial first reaction to the movie. Luke, I'll start with you. I kind of love this movie. I, I think it was really well done overall. Definitely some, things that we had issues with in the last movie that carried into here but at least it was the same it was like something that was already set and they just continued it so i wasn't surprised but overall i really liked a lot of this movie a lot a lot of it good melissa i liked a lot of it too i liked it way better than the miniseries I liked it way better than the first movie in this particular series. Um, I liked Hot Ben. That was great. (laughs) Um, It felt long. I I was getting, like, I lost focus during the walking tours section, but I I checked back in. Um, And not that they were bad. I just, it was dragging for me. It felt long. But I think it's because I knew where it was going and I was just ready for the big battle. But overall, this is the best adaptation that we have to work with. I like if I could agree. only watch one thing, this would be the thing I would watch. And okay. Melissa and I were actually talking on New Year's about just just quickly about this movie. And I feel like this could almost stand on its own. Like you could almost just watch this movie as a single act and get almost everything you need from the first movie because of all the flashbacks you get. And it would stand up. Like, I think you could show this to somebody for the first time experiencing it and they wouldn't be missing a whole lot. I do agree with that. No, I, I do absolutely agree with that. And uh, my first reaction, cause I saw this on September 6th on opening day. I was there Thursday night at 10 PM. Uh, I did not like it. I wasn't a big fan of the movie. I thought the acting was very, uh, just, it felt very dot called. Like, I don't know, like, uh, phoned in it didn't feel genuine everything now i'd also worked all day i was very tired my allergies were bothering me and i literally watched the movie with half my eyes covered looking like i was scared crapless from it but it was just literally my contacts were killing me and i had to sit there eyes covered (laughs) half the time because they just weren't working so i didn't give it a full fair shake of it and so going back through and rewatching it uh for our podcast for our show tonight I did enjoy it. It, it. The beats were there. The There was funny there. The acting was a lot better than what I took for it on the first go through. The first time through, I I, I, I don't know why. I just was a little bit hesitant or didn't give them a, a, a full shake or fair shake. There are a few instances that I didn't like, uh, but again, they kind of tied over from the first one. It wasn't the acting style so much as the direction altogether. So watching them back to back together, it made this one felt a lot better because I didn't watch the first one before going to watch this one in the theater. So, uh, but rewatching the first one again before watching this one, it made this one feel a lot better. I can definitely see though where you're saying that they can stand up on its own because that makes a whole lot of sense. And honestly, it's not a, it's a good horror film. You know, uh, is it a good Stephen King film? Sure. I mean, you most Stephen King films are pretty decent. There's some that are that are horrible, but uh, most adaptations are decent. But this isn't a remake of the book 
per se. It's a taking ideas from the book and putting them into its own story. And I didn't, I didn't mind where a lot of it, when there's a couple parts that we'll get into that we're like, really? But uh, we'll, we'll get to it. So we'll go into our first section of this and it's uh, changes that we noticed from the book. I'll start with kind of my knockout of a few of them. Eddie's a risk management instead of heading a limo uh, company. That makes sense. I'm, I'm like that fits Eddie Kasprak perfectly, especially in these, in this time frame. Uh, you know, being present day, uh, Richie's a stand up comedy, uh, comic, which he again makes sense because back in the 80s, radio hosts were the big thing, were the huge deal. You had the uh, Howard Stearns and all those kind of shock jocks. Now it's more of a you know, stand up com comedian, so it made sense. Uh, and they kind of downplayed really how much of a bastard Tom is. It was just kind of, oh, he's a dick, he hit her, and she's gone, you know, kind of thing, instead of the whole buildup, but that's all we see of Tom, so, okay. I guess that's all they needed. Yeah, that was, I was I was a little surprised that, I mean, Audra got kind of cut out, you know, pulled, pulled back quite a bit, too. We have that initial scene where... Uh, yeah, Bill isn't very good to her. I mean, it, she takes what he says the wrong way, and like they bicker at each other. But I don't know. I I, I felt like it was odd that relationship, and her character just doesn't come back like she does in the book either. So yeah, I don't I don't miss them. Yeah, I don't think it hurt anything not having it there. Other than it is nice to know, like I don't know, knowing the looming doom that tom could be around and pop up at any time like that was really interesting to me when we were reading it like where is that going to play because that was one of the biggest questions i had was how is this all going to work out and when they end up audra and tom in the the hotels right next to each other i was like oh this is gonna go bad for her <laughs> like i don't know i don't know if i don't think it hurts the story at all not having him there but there is there is some loss i guess but yeah. there's enough I don't going think on. feel it in the movie. I think it's more. Yes. Yes. There's enough of doom and gloom and scary happening that you don't need the extra mm -hmm. person. I mean, I agree with you. And and I, I miss not having the Audra on the bike at the end, that reawakening magic piece. Yeah. Um, but, but not having it doesn't ruin the movie for me. Yeah. And I think um, that's my biggest takeaway of those changes, right? Like that doesn't ruin it for me. Um, Derry did not collapse. Right. Just the house itself. Downtown Derry did not collapse into the. Um, In Dusky. The river. I was okay with that. It would be nice to see with, with visual effects, mm -hmm. but it's not, again, it doesn't change how the storyline wraps up, I guess is my way of looking at it. Well, in general, there's a lot less dairy is the enemy like there is in the book. You know, it, there you don't really have much of the turning a blind eye on purpose. I mean, it's there it's a little bit there as like a nod to it, but it's not a right. major player in the story like it is in the book. I will say I did write down a funny line. Um should we be running? This is dairy. I'm kind of getting used <laughs> to kind it. Kind of getting used to it. <laughs> yeah. So Another thing that I uh, had kind of liked was they uh, gave Bev uh, the ability to have premonitions from being sucked into the deadlights, which, yes, first time through, I'm like, what the fuck is that? Blah, 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 blah. But then after us rewatching the miniseries and the first one and our end of book discussion and now watching this again, I'm like, at least she actually had something to do as an adult. <laughs> and it made sense. So I'm OK with it. You know, it, it kind of made me feel like, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't I'm think okay she needed it. premonitions in order to participate the boys didn't and they got to participate now i will say i really liked that she did participate at the end i just i, I think the premonitions was stupid yeah. i don't like it no i, I can understand entirely with it i was just like at least it's something for her to do uh but uh and then i i did kind of like the shift from straight up at towards the end of the book where like adult where Pennywise or it is just going straight after Bill. It's hammer and Bill because he to cut off the head, the rest will fall. This one, you get the feeling it's not he's not just straight up going after Bill. Yeah, he he pulls the kid thing, you know, the kid on the skateboard kind of thing uh, uh, off. But besides that, 
he kind of evenly attacked everyone and mm-hmm. made everyone want to, you know, do what they're, you know, need to do kind of mm-hmm. thing after, yeah, we get the drama of I'm leaving, I'm not leaving, I'm you know, jumping out the bathroom window. Kind of thing. Now, there was also the introduction of the tokens, right? And the, the Shakapiwa, um, mm-hmm. all of that. I mean, obviously, it's still the ritual, but it's clearly much different. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on the having to collect tokens as the reason for doing the walks? and what they were you know obviously the walks were slightly different some of them were you know the same beats you end up with the same stuff but we don't get you know ben in the library with uh the balloon and it pops yeah. and blows blood everywhere but um what do you guys think of the tokens i guess so i, I don't know i mean it it, it made sense it, they had to streamline it's game of consolidation you have to pick your battles and make things make sense so it made sense in the film wise sure a couple of the scenes of the walking tours yeah was just idiotic now granted with the ben one i get it you are never going to top the tim curry make of it so do something completely different i'm fine with that uh but the eddie one where literally the (laughs) uh leper starts puking on him and uh, just call me angel of the morning. Starts to, it's like, what the fuck? Like, that's just dumb. I mean, it, it wasn't even scary. It, it was just like, just dumb. Like, it, it, it just bothered me so much. But it, it, it did throw me off because that was the one moment, too, that I was like, okay, in, in the theater, I'm like, I have to go to the bathroom. Is it, we're like an hour and something in. I'm like, I got this is my bathroom moment because it's an Eddie Walken thing. I don't care. And so I just started headed off as I walked back into the theater to seeing that. I'm like... <laughs> what the hell did I just miss <laughs> kind of thing. But the, uh, going to your point, Luke, the tokens, it, it, it was okay. I, I didn't hate it. It just wasn't my, my ideal, but I can accept it. Melissa. Well, I wonder if it's a nod to like Stephen King himself in that the ending isn't great for his book. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he has this big giant monster, but doesn't ha- in his, let's be honest. And his book does not have a really good way of fighting it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure. We'll just theoretically bite each other's tongues and tell jokes. Like mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a letdown, right? You had said that when we had read the book, you were like, eh. and I think that happens a lot with King, um, particularly in his early work when he was fighting his own demons of um, like substance abuse and those kinds of things. So it's really easy to make a monster and it's really hard to figure out how to get rid of them. Especially. So, yeah. Because if you, if you make it too easy to beat them, it makes it just totally, you know, undercuts the power of that monster, right? Like it, it's like, yeah. how do you make it so powerful, but still possible to kill? Like it's. Yeah. <laughs> but, right. So, so in my head, the tokens were sort of a manifestation of that because it, you had to show something. It obviously wasn't connected to the book, but I was okay with the change. What I wasn't okay with was what happened to Mike because of it. I was fine with the tokens. I I have serious issues with Mike's character. Okay. Well, um, how about we jump into our main part, unless there was something else on the changes from book to film adaptations you guys wanted to touch on or cover? Uh, I mean, there's... Uh, just it's littered with minor changes that I think we kind of agree it overall doesn't don't make much of a difference I think compared to like the mini series changes that were like really that that completely changes a lot like of how the story actually goes in my opinion but we already talked about that so so yeah so all right so we're gonna move on to you know our main topics or main thoughts on this uh melissa i'll let you take the first thought there uh, and i think this is a holdover from the last movie um i know you guys didn't necessarily agree with me but, but one of my favorite things about the movies in general is the dynamic between bill and or not bill um eddie and richie i know there are issues with them being so focused on each other that it detracts from their hero worship of bill and i know there were the undertones of richie being in love with eddie which i didn't mind at all i i thought that was a really interesting take on it um i I don't like how negative they both are particularly eddie and like i can't be here i have to get out of here right Mm -hmm. um but at the same time like i just love i i could watch the two of them literally eddie and richie this version right eddie and richie just them sitting around kids adults 
I don't care. It's not even the actors. It's the writers writing the dynamic of these two people. Mm-hmm. They're hysterical. Um, I and really, I it, with those two ahead. characters, I really loved at the reunion at uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> the Jade of the Orient when, when they're like, oh, you know, uh, Richie, did you get married? And everyone's like, no, no, no way. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you guys, you didn't know. And Eddie's like, no, you didn't get married. And he goes, you didn't hear? You, me and your mom are very happy. <laughs> Okay. It was so. It was such a, a good snap. It was. It was so funny. So a couple of things I wanted to call out. I'm glad you brought that up, Luke. Uh, first, did you catch the very first cameo of the movie? A callback to the original miniseries. Young Ben is actually Ben's assistant, like running the uh, meeting when oh. we first. When we first get to the really? board, when we first get to the boardroom, because uh, they show him, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" They actually brought because I didn't look a lot into all the actors and everything, mm-hmm. uh, like because I was trying to stay as far away from it as much as possible. I didn't want to get spoiled and you know everything. Uh, so I'm like, "Holy shit!" They actually brought him back to be adult Ben, and then I'm like, and then they cut to the screen, and there's uh, <laughs> what's his name? Uh, what is his name? J uh, J Ryan. And, you know, sit on the chair. I'm like, oh, "Okay, that makes sense." But I'm like, "Okay, that's cool." And now. Did anybody recognize uh, Eddie's wife, Myra? She looked familiar, but I I don't know. Same actress that played his mother. Was it? In the, in the first one. Oh, yeah, I did hear okay. that. Yeah, I, and I thought that was well done. Like, cause the, Which makes you sense, because the, they're the supposed to be like, he married his mom, essentially. Ex- yeah, Exactly. So it, it, it was well done. Like, Because the makeup was so well done in the first one, where it was like, oh, oh, okay. You know, you couldn't tell exactly, but it was very, very similar. So cool. I just liked, I liked those two little tidbits that I found, you know, Absolutely. since and everything. Uh, and then the, there was a nice little callback uh, from, I want to say, uh, well, it was definitely to Ben, but the kiss me fat boy. We mm-hmm. did get a kiss. We did get a kiss me fat boy from Pennywise to Ben there. Yep. Uh, so yeah, going to the Eddie and Richie dynamic, I, I liked their dynamic again on the second watch through more so than the first still though i don't like the direction of eddie just as a whole but that's not again on the actor that's on the writing style of him being a dick and he was a dick as a kid and the actor the adult actor mimicked like worked a lot with the child actor to get the mannerisms and get everything down so he did it right uh and so i I give him credit full for doing that he did it well i just wasn't a fan of what they did just personally, but it, it worked. It did work to make you feel for him. So, Luke, what's your uh, first major takeaway there? We we kind of you guys kind of already hit on this and the differences, but w- Bev being taken by Pennywise last movie was a little dumb, right? I think we talked about that. Mm-hmm. It's like really, like is that? Oh, well, let's go save the girl. Like, fine, whatever. Not, I'm not really sure how I feel about this power of foresight of all of their deaths. Like, I, I still, it's like, really? Eh. But at least there's some kind of tie to her having been directly witnessed, uh, you know, to the deadlights themselves. Like, there was some out, lasting outcome from that. Because that should be a really important thing. And... Which makes me think, moving forward, like, obviously, Richie got a, a pretty full blast, too, when Eddie goes to save him. Like, I wonder if there's anything moving forward for him because of that, or if it's not really a thing because Pennywise is dead now. But either way, I was just glad that there was some kind of ramification for her being in direct contact, you know, with the, the deadlights themselves. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a very interesting point I forgot about. Uh, like I didn't think of the Richie aspect of it with uh, getting a full face blast of it too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, but like I said, I, I was okay with it because it, it served some ex exposition purposes, kind of made things help keep the pace up a bit. Uh, one thing though, that I just thought of as you were saying that though, it was a spoiler in from movie one that we would know Audra wouldn't be in this movie or be a factor because we've already seen somebody come out of the deadlights, you know, and that was the whole thing with Audra being in the catatonic state and all that. We've already seen somebody pulled sure. back from that. So it, you know, looking back at it now, it's like, Oh, it had it been paying attention. I would have known. Yeah. Hey, why would they have all, there's no need to have her mm-hmm. in that role kind of thing. So, bench, what's your first big thought? Well, I, I went with mine with uh, the Eddie, uh, gotcha. the, the, the Eddie direction. Uh, just, it, it still stood out to me. Like I, I just, that's one I can't get over. It's just, I, I, I like Eddie more of the whining, sniveling, 
kind of lesser than just the small small man mentality the wasn't napoleon complex you know kid which mm-hmm. i get from from eddie a bit so, in these so so my second note i'll go with mine is uh i love the mrs cursing I, I actually think it's really well done i'm mad because they gave away the entire scene as a trailer like before the movie came out they mm. literally gave a two minute trailer and it was just that scene so i'd seen it like i'm like damn it that's the one scene i did not i i did not want any spoilers on. like i would not have wanted to see at all i wanted to be shocked by that because that, it had some good little creepy jump scares, and like ooh, what the you know moments, and that's what I was looking forward to. So I, I, I liked it. The walking tours were interesting. Uh, I, I kind of we already touched on these, uh, but I didn't mind most of them. You know, Bill's Bar Ben's was very basic. Back to school. Uh, R- Richie's was the most surprising one, being the turnaround because that's where they start letting you in the hints of. Oh, there's, you know, these homosexual undertones and everything. And that's really like, oh, okay. And then towards the end of the movie, we get the final reveal of everything. But, and I was okay with it. It's like, okay, you, you want to add it in? It, that's fine. You know, it, I'm fine with it. And it adds to his character of being that protective asshole, asshole to everybody. Like the, the funny asshole, I should say, to everybody. Because you want to project, you know, your sex. That's why he was always being the over-sexualized character to everybody. It's like, what is there the people only virgins can see this? And it's just being very self protective in that aspect. Mm-hmm. So, Luke, what was your second? Uh, I'll just I'll jump to my third note because it goes right along with yours. I, I really liked the, the walks in general, I thought they were done pretty well. Um, yeah, Ben's was a little boring, but it, it was a nice little scene between young Bev and young Ben as well in there. I in general, and obviously he didn't need to collect anything because he always had the the yearbook page with her name written on it. Yeah. Um, but I, in general, I really liked the the walking tours and the the final fight scene. Like I, I liked the visuals of it. I, I really like that whole three quarters of the movie was good. I was like, I don't know what to even say about these because. It was. I thought it was just enjoyable to watch, and I thought they took their time doing the things that they needed to to make it what the book was in its own ways. You know, like it, the addition of I think his name was Dean, the little kid with mm-hmm. the skateboard in the the Hall of Mirrors. Mm-hmm. Probably could have done without that. That that served nothing for me. Um, I, I really thought I think, Bill's. I think the same with the girl in the bleachers. That one I was more okay with, honestly. Yeah. But I think they're trying to do this. I think it fits the same sort of pattern of he's still attacking little children. Sure, sure. That one just felt more like uh, we gotta have Bill do something on his own. So let's yeah. do this. Like that was the part. I was like, I, I don't really think like Benji already said. It's not as much of a focus on Bill, and that was the one thing that kind of pulls him away. But it just didn't feel like they set it up well enough to do it. I liked the kid though. I mean, he was a, it was yeah. an interesting little character, right. but it was just yeah. odd. And bring up the girl under the bleachers. She's the same one at the beginning of the movie that Adrian Millen gives the prize to. Right. Well, he, and I knew that because she's got um, a birthmark, yeah. mm-hmm. a spot on her face, and mm-hmm. I noticed that right away because one of my children was born with a large collection of spots on her face, and so I always like that's something that stands out to me right mm-hmm. away. And first I was like, oh, cool. They hired an actress with like a a port wine stain because like, that's really awesome. And then she came back under bleach. She's like, oh, they gave her the port wine stain. So you'd remember her. And it it was something that Pennywise could use against her, you know, because he uses. Right. I'm always afraid people are going to laugh in my face and everything. And it gets right to what she, you know, her major you know, fear and everything. And Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I, I just I I liked that that was there and then it twisted on me and I was like oh okay. <laughs> but but bringing that up the Adrian Mellon scene yes I'm so glad it stayed in yes mm-hmm. it was so I, good I think if you hadn't read the book you wouldn't understand the importance of that and how that really does I know we said there wasn't a lot of dairy being dairy but that sets the tone it mm-hmm. set the tone for the book. It set the tone for the movie. I, I think it's really important to see that it's more than just a monster eating little kids. Right. And it's not just affecting the loser's lives. Right. 
yeah no absolutely and uh, it, it yeah it was beautifully done like visually wise like the scene itself was mm -hmm. very disturbing but they got the blue like because when i hear okay they're good to the age of melting like how are they going to do all those balloons and stuff i mean i know you can do a cgi but it looked like they almost did release 10,000 balloons under the, you know, it was that well crafted mm -hmm. uh, yeah. of a scene. So it, it's, you know, and I, yeah, I gave him full credit for him for going out and doing it. You know, if you're not going to have the child orgy, you might as well have the homosexual beat down, you know? And I, I say that jokingly. I'm, the, you know, the homophobic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Same, homophobic. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I want to touch back on the Mrs. Kirsch scene, actually, because I, I thoroughly enjoyed that scene, too. There was a couple, like, when she would run in the background, right? And it's like, is, yeah. she is that woman naked? <laughs> what? And badly CGI'd. I'm right. It, that was, yeah. It, yeah, when she comes out as a monster, yeah, it, it's very off-putting. It's awkward and like, odd, but I liked movie, it. Like you said, Benj, that they work so hard on these beautiful visuals. That's the monster? But like, I think they did that on purpose. Like I don't, I, mm -hmm. I the way at least I'm feeling, they wanted to make it feel so morphed that it had to feel like bad CGI because, it, like at least that's the way I'm making it seem in my own head. Because if it's if they just genuinely <laughs> tried to do it and that's what we got, okay. But I, I just think they try to make it so out there morphed that all you're gonna get is you know, a bad, more bad CGI, but I think they meant it that way. But when she, Mrs. Kirsch is in the kitchen and she starts talking about her father, mm -hmm. I, I thought that was awesome. The way they worked that all in and like, she see, Oh, he worked in the circus. And then she sees Pennywise without his makeup on. And then as she's trying to escape, she looks back down the long hall and sees Pennywise putting his makeup on. I thought that scene was awesome too. Like it was just, to me, a very well done, complete scene other than, yeah, potentially shitty <laughs> CGI on the monster. But in general, I thought that was one of the best parts, uh, definitely the best walking tour, I'd say. Yeah. So some of my other kind of big thought here um, is there were some good movie quotes that happened throughout the movie. There was um, at one point in the movie, somebody goes, here's Johnny. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, look, the shiny. <laughs> Spoiler, it's not in the book. That's that that's a movie thing. Mm -hmm. So not Stephen King approved. But I liked that. And then at one point where they go, Yippee Kaye. And I was like, motherfucker. You're, <laughs> you're supposed to end that with motherfucker, right? Like die hard. How like it's a very die hard moment. How come you're not doing the whole line? But because I, this is a Christmas movie and know. that's not, so <laughs> no, it is not a Christmas movie. Although I did sidebar see a die hard movie Christmas gift box the other day and chose not to buy that for you because I knew that would not so dumb. be accepted. Unacceptable. So uh, I did like the running joke too throughout the movie of, well, yeah, I read the book. What'd you think of it? It was good. Well, what'd you think of the end? It, it, it kind of sucked. <laughs> Not all the endings of your book, book sucked, but this one kind of sucked. And even Stephen King has a cameo in this movie as the shop owner. And he's like, ah, I like the book. The ending kind of sucked. It's like, <laughs> it's like, do you want me to sign it? And he goes, nah, the ending sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, yes, because a lot of people feel, as you know, we've talked about, the ending of this book sucked. It was very lackluster and everything. And I so, wonder how many times he's heard that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I, I'm probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, you know, which is justifiable. And so it made me think as I'm watching this first time, I'm like, they're not going to change a damn thing from the end of that book. I'm like, it's going to be the exact same just as a fuck you to everybody for saying that the <laughs> ending of the book is not good. Yeah, you know, but I, I did like the changes they made uh, to the ending, as you know, we had talked about using the tokens and everything. One thing I did not uh, like, and I'm trying to read your coming here, Luke, make sure I'm not jumping on anything, is uh, their treatment of Mike in this, in the sense of he's more underhanded compared to uh, the, re you know, the, compared to novel style where it was more genuine and everything. He's doing stuff because he feels he has to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get the group instead of what he needs to do to get the group. He seems a lot sense. more manipulative in yes. this than he ever did in the book to me, for sure. I completely agree with that, especially when like, oh, you didn't show him the fourth side, which shows them all dead, I guess, right? It was like a big sacrifice of themselves, the, the Shakopee but 
I don't know. Like it, I agree. I, there are some changes to Mike that don't really seem needed. It, I think a lot of it stems from, again, similar to the miniseries, the lack of commitment from the whole group to even do this. Like the, the hesitation and the, well, why'd you fucking bring us back here? Mike, what the hell's wrong with you, Mikey? Like, no, this is like, that doesn't happen in the book. Like, not really. Yeah. They're all okay. Well, we're here. This is our job. This is what we have to do. And promise. And and by and Stan Stan is the one who gets to say no because Stan makes the choice not to come. Mm -hmm. That's why he commits suicide. Yeah. Because once you make the choice to go, that's the choice. Yes. You either go or you don't. You either go or you die. That's it. I mean right. like if you don't show up, we understand you're out. There is no backing out once you're there. But I agree with your point, Benj, that Mikey is, uh, yeah, a bit more manipulative because he's, it's like he's trying to trick them into doing these things where they should just be going along because that's their fucking job. Yeah. Yeah. At, mm. Pretty much, yeah. Because, yeah, with the book and the miniseries and these movies, I get them intertwined. But, yeah, book-wise, we never got the, oh, we're not doing it, we're not doing it, you know, we're we're out of here and leaving kind of stuff at all, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, no. I'm in, the, in the book, it doesn't really come up. I mean, there's yeah. a little bit of like, are we really doing this? And then there's like the bill going by himself things. But even then, it's kind of like, well, we have to go and help Bill. Like that. There's no ah, uh, screw it. <laughs> like, yeah. You know. So it, it's just yeah, th them taking those liberties with Mike, and it's a tie in to to the first movie too, where they took away his historian stuff from the first movie. Mm -hmm. You know, they made Ben the historian, and now Ben Ben didn't do shit except for get the girl in this movie, in, in my opinion. You know, now I did like the Beverly Ben dynamic in this movie way better than the books, way better than the miniseries. I like because there the was one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, from beginning to end, you know, there was a dynamic between those two characters, and it felt right. You know, I liked the way it was done. But besides that, Ben really didn't have much to do. He wasn't the super smart architect. I mean, he was, but he wasn't like, you know, that guy, you know, the, the second or third in command kind of character. He was just there to be with Bev. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Got I'd agree with that. Speaking of Mike, I am glad that he did get his uh, historian role back right like that's what he's been doing as he should have been and it was also nice to see that ben seemed to have some understanding when mike was like because everyone was like already kind of pushing back at the reunion and it was ben that was like listening intently more than anybody else because he was familiar with it, so it was almost like a they passed the torch well and they showed the realization from from ben well enough that and he was like no no no, let him let him say what he needs to say because that's the same shit that ben was into when he was living there right and so i'm just glad they made that little connection and i'm also really glad that we got the smoke hole scene obviously it was yeah. done a little bit different but i thought it was cool um that it was I'm, done this way i'm glad we had the clubhouse at all mm-hmm yeah, I thought I thought that was interesting. Done well. Yeah. So, all right. Anybody got anything else on big thoughts you want to touch on or anything with this? Uh, my only other one was uh, going to what you, Melissa, you brought up of the Stan suicide thing. I, I did like that closure. Getting that made a lot more of everything feel connected. And it wasn't just Stan being a bitch. You know, he logically broke down. Yeah, here's the here's the reason for it. Now, it's a surprise to me that in that time frame of getting the phone call to the bathtub, he was able to write six letters and set them all off. But it's like, you know, I, I can abide that, you know, little plot hole. So, all right, we're going to move into our least favorite things of this movie. Um, Melissa, I'll let you start with yours. Oh, so hard to choose. Um. <laughs> I think it's the Beverly. I've seen our death, so we have to stop Pennywise now. Motivation. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad she did things. I love empowered Beverly. I don't like. I don't like the deadlights line, like storyline that bothers me. I don't like the death premonition thing, but I really hate that. That's the reason she's like, we have to do this. How about just we just have to do this because there are dead kids or dead everybody or. 
all the other reasons that there are to stop, you know, the mass murdering alien thingy. Let's just stop him. It doesn't have to be because, oh, I've seen our deaths. How about we knew it was bad even before then? I don't know. That yeah. bothers me. The self-preservation really like bullshit. I, I really want to like Mike. I want to like Mike. Mm. I dislike what they did with Mike. I don't dislike the acting. I dislike the change because Mike in the book is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they just, I mean, completely wiped that out. The, there is no Mike from the book in this Mike. They are two completely different characters. I can see where they got Eddie from, from where Eddie in the mm-hmm. book is. I can see the leap. I can see the leap for Richie. I can see the leap for Pat. I can see the changes, large or small, that they've made from book character to movie character. But Mike, there's nothing left. And that bothers me. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. I did like them keeping him with the group since they knocked off uh, oh, Henry yeah. early. Love Keep- that. Yeah. It, it made more sense than the power of five or six or whatever. That was fine. Okay. But- but besides that, yeah, the rest of my stuff agreed. Uh, Luke, your least favorite. <laughs> you I, you very astutely already touched on this, and I apologize. Oh, no, you're see. fine. It's worth <laughs> it's 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 so bad. It's worth re mentioning <laughs> the cheesy music when the leper pukes on Ed's. So terrible. So dumb. Like I, I you've you've already said it. I mean, it's it's so dumb. <laughs> Like why it it kind of makes me think back to the first movie where they had the the cleaning cleaning up montage with yeah like, really it's like it's like the director just has to have some kind of music like montage right. thing inserted just because that's like a check mark that has to be fit into the movie somewhere I, that was not a good way of doing it that was very dumb <laughs> yep. No, I I agree. So my least favorite thing, hashtag don't be a bully. Why do you got to bully Pennywise to death? Come on. You mean nothing. You're, you know, we won't even think about you. You're ugly. It's like, and that's what kills him off. That's what does him in. Really? Really? You're going to bully him to death? I mean, I get it. You had to verbalize and visualize how you're going to, you know, mentally beat this great demonic, you know, space creature. Who's all about mental manipulation? Yeah, but you're going to just you mean nothing to us, you know. We're gonna be we're gonna give you the silent tree. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't just turn their backs on him. Just <laughs> we're not talking to you. <laughs> we're not talking to you. You know, kind of thing. So yeah, that one. It's just I saw. I'm like, are you are, are you fucking kidding me? Everything else of the movie, I'm like, I can live with that one. That one pissed me off. I don't um, have a problem with that. I I thought that was. Fine, I, I, I didn't have a problem with it either. But but. Side note, least favorite is the real overuse of the fake out jump scare. Basically, they're the, oh, we're going to get you. Nope. Oh, but here it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was over and over and over again. And it's like they're trying way more for the horror side of it. And I get it because it's a horror movie more so than the psychological. But give me some psychological shit. Don't just jump and then don't jump and then not jump. You know, it's, I did like the Pomeranian. That was funny. Or was that in the first one? That was in this one. Okay. I was going to add, I thought those was this Yeah. One. Cause they had the three door thing again. Yeah. And they were like, um, what if it's Pomeranian or he's going to come back to Pomeranian and then there's Pomeranian. Mm-hmm. There. It's like, all right, great. All right. So we're going to move on to our favorite things. I'll start with mine. Uh, Bill Hader just fucking killed it he abs- I, I the first time watching through i thought he was the one that did the absolute best he took it the most seriously as an actor and did everything he was supposed to do uh but he uh just uh, hands down stood out to me as showing his chops on the scared side on the emotional side and he brought the funny which bill Hader always does uh, i did like as i mentioned before though the end with the closure of stan too um, Luke, your favorite thing. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a bit of a, a lot of things, but, uh, the book Easter eggs, I, there were too many to not, you know, to list, but they did a good job of making references that really only book readers would appreciate. And I'm glad they did them. Um, the overall visuals of its final form where it's kind of like a spider, but it's not like, I thought they did a much better job in this one than they did in the miniseries. Let's be very clear about that. Hmm. Um, it did feel a bit like a, uh, like a Zelda boss fight. Right. Uh, oh, not Moldorn. Um, I know the one you're thinking of. Oh, there's a uh, bunch of, I mean, there's, there's a ton of them. Uh, well, that I was are, thinking or green of time from the tree. That first one. Oh, the, I, the spider that drops down. Yeah. Um, 
but just in general, like they're running around the circle and like it has a little perch in the middle and then they can go up to the little side room. It just that along with the collecting of tokens earlier in the movie, I was like, this feels like a Zelda game. Like this just what it feels you like. Had to get, you we, had to get the eight or the we seven. You had to get the keys to unlock the door to go in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, the movie is it's really solid. Like there's obviously things that we're being nitpicky on and. There's some things that aren't fantastic, but overall, it's a really solid movie. And the actors in general and the characters were all pretty strong, I thought. Um, Whenever (laughs) it was kind of funny to hear uh, James McAvoy, who's very Scottish, tried to say the word fair like an American. It was awful. He, He doesn't say ours that way. If you go back and watch it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a really hard R for him. And uh, he has to say it twice, like within two sentences. He's he's at the fair. It was it was rough, James. I'm sorry. Oh, but that's funny. It's I didn't catch him, but that's it. It's still it's still up to me every time I've watched it. I was like, man, you can tell he is about as Scottish as a kid that is trying to make an American <laughs> R. Not not happening, bud. Sorry. So Melissa, your favorite thing of this movie? Okay, so I really liked this movie. I liked a lot about this movie. But my favorite thing was the Stephen King scene. I He's so good. He's so funny. And he's so smart. I wonder if he wrote the damn thing. Like, <laughs> he's just brilliant. And part of me wonders, is that how he talks in real life? Right? Like, with that. The main he, accent. He put it on a little extra thick for the movie. In or, the special or, features, I, they talk about it. Oh, they do? Yeah. Because I didn't see that part. So, it was almost like, I know he doesn't speak like that when he's giving talks and he's in public, but I wonder if that's like his home language, right? right? As his work language. Is that how he talks just in general in town? Because like he knows it. Mm-hmm. And I've read enough of his work to know he writes that to dialect. I can hear that when I read some of his dialect work. Mm-hmm. He, he was just my favorite. Oh, he was so, great. He happens to be my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and that's why we have a podcast dedicated to him. (laughs) Oh, Luke, you want to hit the button? All right. And that'll wrap us up for this episode and wraps us up for it. We're done. We've done it all. (laughs) Or something ridiculous. (laughs) Right. But we thank you very much for joining us on this journey. It uh, has meant a lot to us for you joining us with us. We're not going anywhere. We're, we got more uh, coming on this channel, on uh, the show. But if you need to follow us or get a hold of us, follow us uh, at Floats Down Here. Send us some digital balloons. Uh, if you got any questions or anything, at floatsdownhere at gmail.com. You can find all of our stuff at thepodcastthat.com. Make sure you subscribe and rate us on iTunes. This show and all of the shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. Not a patron yet? Find out more at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. So as I said, make sure you stay tuned and stay subscribed because we're going to be back with our book club. Melissa, you want to give a description of that? Absolutely. So as you guys know, I have been a Stephen King fan for more than 20 years at this point. Actually, we're going on 25. It's been 25 years that I've been a Stephen King fan. And I finally got some boys hooked on it with me. So our plan is now that we've finished it, we are not going to start another chapter by chapter book review. That is that was intense. <laughs> and so we're going to take a little bit of a break from that format and move to what I call um, the introduction to the great library works of the bibliographical works of Stephen King. So I have hand selected 12 early ish works of Stephen King, nothing published past 2000. Um, we're going to read one book a month and then we're going to live stream the conversation. It's literally, they're going to read it. I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. We're going to get some takeaways, favorite parts, and then we're going to rank them compared to each other compared to it. Was it better? Was it worse? Where does it fall? We will start actually on January 13th. Mm-hmm. will be our first book. We are starting with the very beginning, Carrie, very first novel. It's only 199 pages, guys. So this one should be an easy plow through. We're going to start with that. Join us on our live stream or you can catch this. We will also publish the podcast a few days later. So you'll be able to continue to listen to this on your favorite podcast catcher. 
And then I will also make sure to publish the full year's worth of book releases. Find that on social media. I'll put that on Instagram and on Twitter. So you can find that as well. Um, Carrie is first. I know um, uh, Salem's Lot is second. Shining is third. And then we go on from there. So join us. Pick your favorite Stephen King book. Read the books ahead of time along with us. Maybe you've already read them multiple times like I have. Maybe you're new and you're like, oh, I'll, I'll read it and then see what they say that we would love to have you. But I really feel like this is a good opportunity to introduce. So now that you guys are sucked into my Stephen King world, let's let's break down and get through a whole bunch of them to get you guys going. Nice. So remember, just join us whenever you can and you'll float too. Stay imaginary. Thanks.